Hello, my name is Ashley Robertson with RBC Consultants. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Skin Chat webinar, an algorithm for the management of atopic dermatitis in people with skin of color. For speakers tonight, we have Dr. Andrew Alexis, Professor of Clinical Dermatology, Vice Chair for Diversity and Inclusion, Will Cornell Medicine in New York, New York. We also have Dr. Heather Woolery Lloyd, Director of Skin of Color Division, Dr. Philip Frost, Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery, University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. We'd like to thank our supporter this evening, Sarah B, for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of technical tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having any technical issues or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will be emailed to you within one to two days. We would greatly appreciate it if you could fill in this very short survey. And also within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance and the recording will be emailed to you. Again, if you have any questions, please submit your questions using the question chat pane on the right hand side of your screen. As object objectives for tonight's webinar, we are going to cover understanding racial and ethnic variations in atopic dermatitis, discuss therapeutic options, including optimal skin care for AD in patients uh, with skin of color, and discuss a practical algorithm for the management of AD in patients with skin of color, including the role of skin care. Without further ado, I would like to pass the floor virtually to Dr. Andrew Alexis. Well, thank you, Ashley, for the kind introduction, and thank you all for tuning in uh, today or this evening, depending on where you are. And uh, it really is my pleasure to speak tonight about uh, a topic that I think we can all relate to, a, a condition that we treat every day, we see and treat every day. And what we'd like to do tonight is really highlight some of the unique aspects of treating atopic dermatitis in our patients with skin of color and offer some, hopefully some helpful practical uh, tips uh, in an algorithm, in a recently developed algorithm uh, for uh, the management of your patients with, with skin of color. Let's kick things off with a polling question. So when you think about your patients with skin of color who have atopic dermatitis, which of the following is a prominent clinical feature? Is it bright red erythema? Is it perifollicular accentuation? Is it less severe pruritus? Or is it skin pain? So go ahead and uh, enter your, your best answer and we'll see how what the results look like. Very good. Over three quarters of the of, of the audience tonight uh, selected the correct answer, which is perifollicular accentuation, and we will certainly uh, talk about that uh, later in the presentation. So I'm going to just take control of the slides once again and and get started. All right. So when we think about uh, atopic dermatitis in patients with skin of color. Uh, we, we note that there are variations, variations in epidemiology, variations in clinical presentation, variations in quality of life impact, and some nuances in the overall approach to treatment. There are many similarities as well with uh, treating AD in any population, but tonight we're going to talk about some of the, the key distinct features that we see in our patients with skin of color. Starting with epidemiology, when we look at multiple epidemiologic studies, we see that uh, um, multiple studies have shown a higher prevalence of atopic dermatitis in black children compared to white children in the United States. We've seen similar studies outside the United States as well, most notably in the UK, where uh, a, sim a different study, similar findings that AD was more, more common uh, in Afro-Caribbean black children in London compared to white children in London. Now, we also have reports that the severity of atopic dermatitis might be even more severe at the time of presentation uh, in patients uh, with skin of color, most notably in a study looking at black children compared to white children using SCORAD as the uh, assessment of severity. Once the erythema score was adjusted for, uh, black children uh, had a greater severity of atopic dermatitis uh, than white children in this one study. 
So here are some of the studies that uh, are referenced. This is from the US. African-American children were 1.7 times more likely to have atopic dermatitis than their white counterparts in this uh, epidemiolo epidemiologic study in the US. Now, the, you might wonder, well, what about uh, socioeconomic factors and geographic factors? Well, some of these potential confounders were controlled for, and nevertheless, um, there was still a higher prevalence uh, found. Uh, let's look at the burden in a different way. What about healthcare utilization? So this is data. It's getting a little uh, um, uh, outdated here. Uh, it'd be nice to see uh, a, a more recent study uh, of this nature, but this is the best available data we have from the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey um, that looked at healthcare utilization for atopic dermatitis and compared it across different racial ethnic groups. And they found that uh, uh, self-identified black or African-American groups had two-fold higher uh, visit rate per capita than white patients. And for Asians or Pacific Islanders, the rate was six-fold higher per capita versus whites where atopic dermatitis was diagnosed. So clearly uh, more healthcare utilization for AD uh, in, in patient populations with skin of color. And the reasons for this, we can speculate as to why, but it does just uh, it does speak to the overall burden of this disease in our patients with skin of color. So we recently reviewed uh, um, the the available literature on uh, atopic dermatitis in skin of color populations. I had the pleasure of working with uh, with my colleague this evening, um, Heather Willoughby Lloyd, and other colleagues on this paper published in the JDD in 20. 22, and I welcome you to refer to it. Very briefly, um, we had a panel of six dermatologists from the US where we reviewed the literature and came up with uh, 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 statements that we agreed on um, that address uh, key, key features key issues, key differences of atopic dermatitis in skin of color. And you don't have to squint to read these five statements because we're going to talk about them one by one. First statement was that atopic dermatitis is certainly a common, chronic, inflammatory skin disease. We know it has multifactorial and its pathogenesis. We know that there's a genet there are genetic factors, immunologic factors, environmental factors. But what we're learning is that these factors may, may differ, may vary across different populations, across diverse uh, populations. One of the differences that has been identified is uh, the rate of uh, filaggrin loss of function mutations in different uh, racial ethnic groups. On the whole, in non-white racial ethnic populations, including those of African ancestry and those of various Asian uh, ancestries, have been shown to have lower rates of, of these uh, filaggrin loss of function mutations. Uh, in fact, this is a summary of, of uh, some of the published literature on this. And again, you don't have to squint to read all of this, but I will say the bottom line is that the prevalence of loss of function filaggrin does indeed vary by population with lower frequencies in East Asian populations and those of African descent, as I mentioned. Now, what about other differences? Well, there are some studies that have looked at barrier properties across different racial ethnic populations, including this one, which is uh, from Denmark. This was a multi-ethnic, multi-racial population in Copenhagen, Denmark, and they measured the ceramide to cholesterol ratio in the stratum corneum of three groups, those of African descent, those of Asian descent, and those of uh, who are Danish F, uh, 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 with Caucasian um, uh, racial identity. And uh, what they found, as in um, a couple other studies previously, is that the ceramide levels, in this case, ceramide to cholesterol ratio, was lowest in uh, the individuals of African descent uh, compared to the other two groups. And this might contribute to some of the observed differences in prevalence and severity of xerosis that we see in the clinic. But uh, I think larger studies are, are necessary to better understand uh, the, the relevance of this uh, lower ceramide content that's been found in studies like this. Now, there have been other studies that have identified uh, various endotypic differences between different uh, patient populations with, with atopic dermatitis. Most notably, the work by Emma Gutman at Mount Sinai in New York has identified a number of uh, specific endotypes uh, that have different 
degrees of immune polarization, uh, most notably uh, in East Asian uh, population. It's been found uh, to have uh, in, in one study to have a skewing towards uh, Th2 and Th17 uh, predominant profile, uh, whereas in uh, African American uh, patients with atopic dermatitis, it was Th2, Th22 driven, but an absence, an attenuation of Th17 and Th1. And so the bottom line is that this, that this is a very heterogeneous disease, and there may be differences not just in the phenotype, but also in uh, in the endotype of the, the disease across different populations, and more studies are needed to better understand these. So the second statement is that there are clinical and morphological differences of atopic dermatitis in patients with skin of color. Uh, these include the presence of follicular or perifollicular papules as that uh, survey question that we uh, asked uh, moments ago, xerosis in black atopic dermatitis patients being particularly uh, stigmatizing um, for uh, visual and cultural reasons. And so this was a statement that we agreed on. And let's go through the key um, uh, morphological and clinical differences. And I think it would be easiest to do this just by showing pictures. So. The, mo the first and most uh, obvious difference when we look uh, morphologically at, at uh, lesions of atopic dermatitis in the context of richly pigmented skin is that the erythema may not manifest as a bright red or pink, but rather various other shades. We sort of have to broaden our color palette. Uh, nevertheless, the inflammation is still there. And if you look carefully, you can still see some shades of red, but, there, but what jumps out at you is more of a gray. Um, and something that's helpful is first calibrating your eye to the non-lesional skin and then moving your gaze over to the, to the lesional skin. And then you really begin, begin to appreciate a little bit more um, the, the, the various shades of erythema that are different in, in darker complexions. So here we have a shade of red-brown in lesional skin here. It's not just post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. There is inflammation here. You see that red-brown. It is not just brown. Um, another example, if I can advance the slide, there we go. Perifollicular um, uh, papules, a very common morphology that we see in our patients of African ancestry. Um, and we can see a larger uh, papules that can coalesce into plaques, uh, more of a papulonodular uh, morphology is common. Extensor surface has been reported to be more common in populations of African descent, especially according to one large Nigerian study. Again, papulonodular morphologies appear to be more common in patients of African descent. Lichenoid uh, morphology, also reportedly greater in patients of African descent, including the large Nigerian study I mentioned. And when we look at our Asian populations, this nice study identified uh, phenotypic differences, including a tendency for some psoriasiform features clinically and histologically, as well as even the e immune polarization supporting that too, as I mentioned earlier. A very um, one uh, aspect of atopic dermatitis that cuts across the whole spectrum of patients with skin of color is the tendency to develop uh, uh, dispigmentation as a sequela of this chronic inflammatory condition. And this can certainly add to the overall burden of the disease as it affects patients' uh, function and quality of life, having disfiguring uh, areas of pigmentation. So this is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation with a little zone of depigmentation in an area of, of chronic, over the years, uh, excoriation, uh, causing some permanent uh, damage to the melanocytes for physical injury. And this is post-inflammatory hypopigmentation perilesionally as the lesion is, is, is resolving, leaving behind this rim of hypopigmentation. Thankfully, this is self-limited, of course. We can also see hypopigmentation as, a, as a, uh, a function of using topical corticosteroids as a side effect of corticosteroids. This is particularly true when we're using our, our super potent and potent corticosteroids, particularly for longer periods of time and to larger areas. So a third statement has to do with cultural factors, and this is something we probably don't talk about enough because let's face it, uh, cultural factors influence uh, basic skincare norms, uh, including uh, 
bathing uh, habits, for example, choice of soap or cleanser, the use of, uh, uh, of a cloth or rag or scrubber to, to in the bathing process, the tendency to use moisturizers after bathing, that, that, all, that all varies uh, by culture, uh, as well as geography too. Uh, so uh, this statement pertains to cultural factors related to these practices, and uh, we should consider these when we are treating our patients and coming up with recommendations for our patients, and to do so in a culturally um, uh, humble and competent manner. Now, when our patients are uh, Having, are using uh, traditional soaps, uh, harsh detergents with you know harsher surfactants. These can be deleterious to the skin barrier. They can be this can result in enhanced protease activity and breakdown of corneodesmosomes uh, and ultimately um, uh, a compromise in the skin barrier function. And so it is just so key to uh, emphasize. Uh, best practices for uh, the choice of, of soap or cleanser, ensuring um, good choice of surfactant. And we're going to hear more about this from Dr. Worley Lloyd, so I won't elaborate too much further. But it's, it's so key to include skincare in our overall management of atopic dermatitis. And when we look at guidelines from, from around the world, various regions around the world that have been published, you'll see in the middle column uh, whether or not skincare has been included in these guidelines. And, and it seems that there's broad consensus that skincare is an important thing to include in the overall management of atopic dermatitis beyond just a pharmacologic therapy. In fact, over-the-counter skincare products uh, play a role in prevention for milder cases and for uh, for maintenance, uh, uh, treatment, actual treatment, milder cases, it, it could uh, just moisturization alone can sometimes be sufficient, or it's certainly as an adjunct to our prescription therapy, no question about that, and for maintenance therapy uh, after we get flares under control with our pharmacologic interventions. So statement four has to do with treatment. So how do we improve outcomes with our treatments with our patients with skin of color? Well, given that there are these sequelae of pigmentary uh, uh, alterations um, and uh, this uh, burden uh, induced by dispigmentation and the this visibility of xerosis. Uh, and uh, we didn't talk about itch much, but also the consequences of severe itch and excoriations uh, on the skin. It's especially important to aggressively treat all the immune and inflammatory factors over a period of time and achieve long-term control in our patients with skin of color because the consequences include all of, also dispigmentation and in some cases, permanent scarring. So um, when it comes to the approach to, to treatment, we reviewed the data and found uh, that there are very few studies that um, compare efficacy and safety across different racial ethnic populations. Um, but with the best available data, as well as expert experience, we put together an algorithm for the management of atopic dermatitis and skin of color. Briefly, our methodology uh, included uh, an overall uh, definition of, uh, of the, uh, the disease state and the populations that we were looking for. And uh, ultimately, we uh, came to find uh, 73 uh, uh, sorry, a total of uh, 97 papers, uh, which broke down as shown on the slide, uh, so, and uh, many of them were excluded for, for not meeting criteria. But we'll jump to the bottom line is what did we come up with with the review of the literature and our expert uh, experience? And in many ways, this algorithm has a lot of similarities with a the guidelines for atopic dermatitis across any population, but there are some specifics here that, that relate to patients with skin of color. Starting at the top, um, we emphasize the importance of, of uh, optimal skin care to promote a healthy uh, barrier uh, and to avoid agents that might promote dryness and, and increase transepidermal water loss. We talk about the importance of patient education uh, and uh, preventative uh, uh, factors to really minimize flares because with every flare can come more pigmentary sequelae, which last for weeks to months, sometimes years, uh, and have an additional burden. 
So looking at the algorithm a little bit more broadly, it's broken down into uh, mild, moderate, and severe. And another way of looking at it is we make a decision every time we see a patient is whether this patient can be managed on topical therapy alone, or is this a patient that will require more than topical therapy, such as phototherapy, or um, injectable biologics, or a oral JAK inhibitor? So we're, we're lucky to have a range of options, newer options today uh, compared to just a few years ago. Of course, we still have our traditional systemic therapies that we sometimes use off-label uh, to treat uh, the more moderate to severe uh, um, ends of the spectrum that won't respond just to topicals, but more and more we are depending on the largely safer uh, options that we have today. Now, once we uh, achieve our goal of getting to clear or almost clear, we move into maintenance mode. And this is where we can leverage our topical therapies when needed, uh, topical calcineurin inhibitors, topical PD-4 inhibitors, so, uh, periodic use of topical corticosteroids certainly are appropriate, and ongoing use with, of the uh, over-the-counter um, uh, sophisticated uh, moisturizers, including uh, those that contain ceramides. When we're in our severe end of the spectrum, this is where there's no doubt where we need systemic therapy, whether it's biologic, we have two options, dupilumab and tralokinumab, our oral JAK inhibitors, where we also have two options in the United States, uh, upatacitinib and abrocitinib. Uh, we have our traditional immunosuppressives, which we use off-label. And even when we've got systemic therapy, we can still combine topicals with that, including uh, some newer options that are in development today. And then, of course, there's phototherapy when, when, when needed. Now, if there's relapse um, after a period of control and there's relapse, of course, we have to reconsider uh, adding uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, additional agents to put out the flare, and it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. But on the bottom right of this is where this is very unique to skin of color, is the pigmentary sequelae. And so what do we do about them? What do we offer to our patients? Well, uh, we know that there's a, a UV, sun-induced, uh, uh, UV, invisible light-induced, increases in mel melanogenesis. So sun protection is important, otherwise we might uh, uh, excite the melanocytes to produce more pigment and, and worsen the hyperpigmentation. On a case-by-case -case basis, we may want to consider skin lightening compounds. It's a bit of a double-edged sword. Some of them can cause irritation, such as hydroquinone, particularly at higher concentrations, might be uh, irritating to a patient, especially one who's atopic. Um, certainly, topical retinoids, such as found in triple combination therapies, uh, very difficult to use in any topic patients and may not be the best choice uh, for most patients. Um, so we'll talk uh, about other options there. Uh, and uh, it's so key to make sure that we do not under-treat these patients to really aim for that maintenance of clear or almost clear to the best of our ability using the broad range of topical, oral, injectable, agents or phototherapy that we have in our armamentarium today. All right, so I hope that was a helpful overview of our new uh, algorithmic approach to the management of atopic dermatitis, and it's my pleasure to turn things over to my good friend and colleague from Miami, Heather Woolery lloyd Thank you, and thank you for such a great summary on the topic. So we are going to start now with my um, polling question. So let me get control of the slides here. And there we go. So let's do polling question number two. So the question is, do topically applied ceramides affect ceramide levels, levels within the epidermis? So do you think when we apply a ceramide containing cream topically, it affects physiologic levels of ceramides? So, Yes or no? I'm curious to see what you all think. And we'll learn a little bit more about this um, in my section of this presentation. So 75%, again, two thirds uh, agree that or believe that topically applied ceramides affect ceramide levels within the epidermis. I'm going to present some interesting data on that topic. 
So let's see, let me gain control again and we'll go forward. So I'm gonna focus on skincare and skincare in our skin of color atopic dermatitis patients. Now, when it comes to just regular personal care practices, some of our skin of color patients, not all, but some can do things to the skin that is not beneficial for atopic dermatitis. And the one that comes to mind quickly is the more likely incidence of over scrubbing or cleaning the skin. I'm from the Caribbean and it's very, very common for people to scrub the skin with washcloths. Um, and in our atopic patients, obviously that really isn't necessary, let's say on the forearms or on the legs. Um, also, certain skin of color populations are more likely to use washcloths and exfoliating cloths, which again can be irritating to the skin barrier in our, skin, in our atopic derm patients. And some of our skin of color populations are often use highly fragranced products. I'm based in Miami and in our pharmacy, there's a whole section dedicated to baby perfumes, which obviously wouldn't be ideal in our atopic patients. So there are some skincare habits that can definitely influence uh, atopic dermatitis in our skin of color patients. So when it comes to cleansers, we really have come a long way from when cleansers were first introduced. So the first cleansers were traditional soaps, which were highly alkaline. So you can see on this table here that the soap and the combar have pages up to 12, which is highly alkaline and irritating to the skin. Liquid cleansers and non-greasy cleansers are less alkaline. They can have a pH up to around seven, but what we really want are cleansers that have a pH close to the physiologic pH of our skin. So you can see the last line item there, the multivesicular emulsion system based cleanser has a pH of between four and six, which is what is ideal for our skin. So when you look here, you can see healthy skin has an acid mantle, has a pH of between four and six. Interestingly, tap water is neutral to alkaline. So even just putting water on the skin can make the skin more alkaline than it should normally be. And of co course, soap is extremely alkaline and should be avoided in our atopic patients. And why is this important? Because we do know that acidic formulations, so formulations with a pH between four and six have the lowest risk of irritation in our atopic dermatitis patients. Neutral pH products have a medium risk of irritation and alkaline products are highly irritating. So our goal with our atopic patients are to choose cleansers and moisturizers that have a clo as close to a physiologic skin surface pH of around four to six. That's more likely to reduce the risk of skin irritation and improve the skin barrier function. So when you do have an elevated pH or a pH of greater than six, we do see increased inflammation in the skin and we actually see a, a, a change in the barrier. There's stratum corneum cohesion issues. So it decreases when you have an elevated pH and also issues with the permeability barrier. So high pH products are not ideal for our atopic patients. And by using a acidic pH between four and six, it's better for the barrier, you have better epidermal differentiation and reduced inflammation. So this is a very interesting study. I like to present this study because it looks, it talks about bathing practices. We, and when it comes to skincare and eczema, we talk about moisturization and moisture of course is key. And we probably talk a little bit less about bathing practices and practical advice for bathing. So this is a study, tiny, tiny study, 10 subjects, five atopic derm uh, patients and five healthy skin subjects. And they gave them different bathing regimens. So, or the, the participants had different bathing med regimens. So treatment regimen A was a 10 minute bath with no moisturizer at all. B was a 10 minute bath with immediate moisturizer application. C was a 10 minute bath with a delayed moisturizer application. So 30 minutes later, and then D was no bath, just applying moisturizer directly to the skin. And then they measured hydration after each of these treatment regimens. So interestingly, emollient alone caused the biggest increase in hydration. So um, that teaches us that bathing, actually, we kind of do know this, that bathing does reduce hydration, bathing alone. So just applying emollient had a 206% increase um, in hydration from baseline. Bathing with an immediate emollient or with a delayed emollient 30 minutes later did increase hydration to 141%. So whether you applied it immediately or 30 minutes later, it didn't matter. And of course, bathing alone reduced hydration in the skin 
Um, it was at 91%, so lower than the baseline. So the limitations of the study, they only use one emollient cream. So different emollients that, for example, contain stratum corneum lipids like ceramides may yield an even greater skin hydration. So this is a really interesting study because I don't think we look at actual specific um, bathing criteria for a lot of our atopic dermatitis patients. Now, Dr. Alexis mentioned that all of the guidelines across that international guidelines across internationally do discuss skin care. But when you look specifically at what they're discussing, there's a heavy emphasis on moisturizers. So in every guideline you can see here, moisturizers are recommended and they describe the types of moisturizers that are helpful. Less, when you look at these international guidelines, less discuss cleansers. So I think there is room for us to increase our education on the type of cleansers that we need to use for our patients with atopic derm. Um, you can see here in these uh, guidelines, they didn't mention any bathing or cleansing recommendation. So across the board internationally, moisturization is really heavily emphasized, but I do think we have some room for improvement to incorporate the importance of cleansing habits in our atopic dermatitis patients. So statement five from that paper that we wrote originally that was published what discusses skincare. And it talks about clinical studies. It says clinical studies have shown that a skincare regimen incorporating a ceramide containing moisturizer improves atopic dermatitis, increases lipid content, including ceramides in the skin, and may offer clinical benefits in patients with skin of color. So let's take a look at that. So we do know our physiologic lipids are ceramides, cholesterol, and free fatty acids. Those are the integral important lipids in our stratum corneum. And they really are really important in that skin barrier. They're very important for maintaining the integrity of our skin. And we also know that ceramide levels are significantly reduced in inflammatory skin conditions. So the table on the right is acne. And this is interesting, even though we're talking about eczema tonight, the statement on the, the table on the right, you can see here that without acne, they had the highest levels of ceramides in this study. Mild acne had a slightly lower level of ceramides and moderate acne had the lowest. So inflammation, it tends to be associated with lower, inflammatory skin conditions are associated with lower ceramide levels. And of course, in atopic dermatitis, this has been shown to be the case. In this particular study, they showed the uh, dark blue bar air patients with atopic dermatitis in their lesions and the light blue bars, healthy patients, and ceramides one, two, and three were statistically significantly lower in the atopic dermatitis patients. So we definitely know that ceramides play a role in inflammatory skin conditions and appear to be reduced in inflammatory skin conditions. Now, when we look at the differences in racial skin properties and different racial ethnic groups, um, there's some interesting data here. I think that Dr. Alexis talked about the ceramide levels and you can see here consistently in multiple studies, that it appears that patients of African descent have the lowest levels of ceramides. I also think consistently in multiple studies, skin reactivity appears to be higher in our Asian sub patients. But when it comes to transepidermal water loss and water content, those studies are a little bit more conflicting. So I don't think we have consensus yet on those um, two skin properties um, in, between different racial ethnic groups. The other issue with all of these studies, and there are dozens and dozens of studies that look at skin properties in different racial ethnic groups, is that generally they're very small, they have varying methodologies, and then how the racial ethnic groups are defined is inconsistent between the studies. And also I think significantly, there's no standardization of the skincare regimen before these measurements are done. So it's very difficult to interpret this data. But we do have some data that appears to be consistent and it definitely across multiple studies, ceramide levels appear to be lower in patients of African descent. Now, there are other clinical implications of the skin barrier differences in skin of color. And um, some of these, you know, we heard earlier, obviously there's a higher rate and prevalence of atopic dermatitis in black patients and um, in some studies in Asian patients. 
Xerosis seems to be very prominent clinically. Pruritus seems to be very prominent clinically. But there are also some cultural perceptions. So there's ashy skin. So in people with darkly pigmented skin, when the skin is dry, there's a gray ashen appearance to the skin. And that is highly stigmatizing in certain cultures, it's particularly in cultures of African ancestry, people of African ancestry. And of course, the cultural perception sensitive skin appears to be more prevalent and also more discussed in East Asian populations. So let's now jump into skincare and talk about moisturizers. So we all know that moisturizers are really important in atopic dermatitis. They are helpful for prevention. They're helpful for uh, treatment of mild disease, and they're certainly helpful as adjuncts in for any type of disease, whether mild, moderate, severe. So what does the ideal moisturizer look like? Well, we want it to be safe and effective and cost effective. We want it to be additive, fragrance, and sensitizing agent free. We want it to be pleasant to use, and we want it to optimize the lipid and water content in the stratum corneum. And most importantly, your patients have to be satisfied because they have to want to put it on. I always tell patients, it doesn't work if you don't use it. So patients have to want to put on their moisturizer. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about CeraVe's multivesicular emulsion system. So if you haven't heard that term before, basically the MVE system is a multi-phase oil and water emulsion. And they're basically a series of concentric spheres of oil and water in phases. So the MVE he traps the key ingredients in either the oil or water layers and releases them slowly layer by layer over time. So how is this different than a regular moisturizer? So a conventional moisturizer, we apply it to the skin, there's kind of a burst release of the moisturizing ingredients. And just as quickly as that moisture is delivered, it tends, the benefits tend to wear up a little more quickly. Whereas with the MBE technology, there is a sustained release over time. And that's why we see very effective moisturization with products using this technology. So the CeraVe products in general contain the MVE technology and also key ceramides that we know are really, really helpful in maintaining the skin barrier. So there are studies that have looked at ceramide containing cleansers and moisturizers in patients with atopic dermatitis. Many of these studies are on this slide and I'm gonna go into a few of these in a little more detail. So the polling question asks, can topically applied ceramides change the physiologic ceramides in the skin? Um, so when we apply a, a moisturizer to the skin, is that just topical or do we actually see a change in the stratum corneum? And the next few studies I'm going to talk about will answer that question. So the first study, uh, it's called the Restore Study Phase 1, and it doesn't look specifically yet at the ceramides. It's really looking at hydration. So this was a study of 22 adults, and they applied five different creams to their legs, and one area was not treated. So you can see here the right lower leg and the left lower leg, and the reference creams were CeraVe cream, CeraVe lotion, and then three different reference creams, A, B, C, and then no treatment. And they evaluated skin hydration um, after a single application. And you can see here, so the CeraVe cream and lotion, which are the black and the blue lines, do you see this nice rise, high rise in skin capacitance, which is a measure of skin hydration. And you can see that it's maintained over the 24 hours. That's because of that MVE technology that I spoke to you about earlier. Whereas the reference creams were, um, very not there was maybe a slight increase in hydration but it definitely wasn't maintained over time so that's one interesting finding and i think it's important to have kind of head-to-head -head studies because a lot of times we don't get the benefit of that now this is the second part of this study uh it's the restore study so this is the phase two of this restore study which was recently published in the last several months in the british journal of dermatology and in this study, you can see here, um, it was 34 subjects and they used the product twice daily for four weeks. And they used a ceramide containing cream or an emollient cream. Actually, I skipped this out, I'm gonna go back. And you can see here with the ceramide containing cream, um, there is decreased transepidermal water loss compared to this emollient cream. Here is the transepidermal water loss, and this is the rate of elevated transepidermal water loss. So transepidermal water loss was reduced comparing the ceramide-containing cream to the reference emollient. 
Now, the key question, what the poll question was about was stratum corneum lipids, right? We want to know when we apply these lipids or ceramide-containing lotion, does it actually change physiologic lipids? And this study suggests that it does. So tape stripping is a way to measure lipids or components within stratum corneum. And essentially, tape is applied to the skin and stripped off. A solvent is used to dissolve the contents of that tape. And then you can measure how much lipid was actually in the stratum corneum. So you can see here that there were increased lipids in the stratum corneum compared to this reference emollient. So using the ceramide containing cream appeared to increase the lipid measurements in the stratum corneum. The other things that were measured in this here, the orange is the ceramide containing cream and the blue is the reference cream. You see increased hy hydration across the board and reduced dryness across the board. So, and the most actually most importantly, is skin sensitivity. So I think that knowing that the skin is more hydrated and there's less chance of epidermal water loss is interesting, but something that has real life application is skin sensitivity. So the way you can measure that is, and how they measured it, was with SLS, which is a highly irritating patch. So that patch was applied on day 29 of the study. So they've been using the products twice daily for four weeks. And on day 29, the SLS patch was applied. It was removed on day 30, and the reactivity was measured on day 31. And again, you can see here that there was less visual redness in the areas that were treated with the ceramide cream compared to the reference cream. And there was also less of a change in transepidermal water loss because obviously that irritation would increase transepidermal water loss, but that was lower in the ceramide treated areas. So this study is very interesting because it showed us that compared to a reference cream, this ceramide contain containing cream increased skin hydration, water content, decreased skin dryness, and I think for a real clinical relevance to us, it increased protection from irritants because we know our eczema patients get very irritated very quickly. And also interestingly, that ceramide containing cream was more cosmetically acceptable than the reference emollient. So the subjects liked that side better because it was like a half and half study. Now, this is another interesting study looking specifically at people with atopic dermatitis. So it was a large study, 151 subjects. It was six weeks. And group one were teenagers and adults. And group two were uh, children, basically ages um, 11 and under. And they had monotherapy. So these are people with atopic dermatitis and they were not treated with prescriptions. They were treated with the ceramide containing cleanser and moisturizer. And they were evaluated at day zero and at day 42. And then they had many things done, photographs, score ad, which is a measure of eczema and quality of life scoring. And this group is group one, which is ages 12 years of age and older. So the teenagers and adults, Let's see how they did. So the light pink bar was day zero, and the dark red bar is day 42. And I want to focus on these two over here, which is very itchy and AD symptoms. And the reason why I want to focus on that is because the number one impact on quality of life for a lot of our eczema patients is the itch. That is what keeps them up at night. It interrupts their sleep. It's difficult to concentrate when you're very itchy. So most of these patients, teenagers and adults, started out very itchy. Almost 100% of them were very itchy. And at the end of the study, just with the ceramide-based cleanser and moisturizer, you know, less than 10% were very itchy at the end of the study. Um, and again, with AD symptoms. So these are all the other symptoms beyond itch of AD. And you see this dramatic reduction in AD symptoms at the end of the study. Now, looking at group two, so these were the kids um, younger than 12 years of age, we see the same trend. They didn't start out as itchy, but they still had quite a few were itchy or very itchy. And you can see this reduction at the end of the study. But with AD symptoms, again, close to 100% had AD symptoms or 100% had AD symptoms at the beginning of the study, and only 22% did at the end of the study. So this is a really interesting study because this is atopic dermatitis treated just with ceramide-based cleansers and moisturizers alone. Now, this is a different study. This is a study that looked at adult women, 30 to 65 years old. Um, it was 49 women in this study, and they had dry skin on the legs, dry to very dry skin on the legs. 
and they were um, treated with a moisturizing cream twice daily on the one leg and the other leg was untreated. And then they looked at different signs of hydration and also ceramide content at day three, week four, and 48 hours after stopping this topical cream. So what did we see with this ceramide, the ceramide containing cream? So at baseline, uh, again, as measured by tape stripping, this was the amount of ceramides in the skin. And you can see there was an 11% increase in ceramides in the skin at the end of four weeks. Then they stopped completely using the moisturizer and they measured them 48 hours later. And even after 48 hours after stopping use, total ceramide content remained 4% above baseline. So there was some residual effect. What about other of the other lipids in the skin? So there was an increase in cholesterol, 14% increase in cholesterol at four weeks. And again, even after stopping, 48 hours after stopping use, the cholesterol levels remained 7% above baseline. And there was an 11% increase in free fatty acids in four weeks. And again, some of that was maintained even 48 hours after stopping using these topicals. So what can we conclude when it comes to skin of color and atopic dermatitis? Well, we do know that racial ethnic differences in genetic and clinical presentation and sequela have been reported. And we have reviewed a lot of the literature that has been shown on that. Oh, for optimal outcomes in our atopic dermatitis patients, we want early treatment and longitudinal control. So we really do wanna be aggressive because we do wanna prevent that pigmentary sequela, which also significantly impacts, impacts quality of life in our atopic patients. The treatment and maintenance algorithm for skin of color patients with atopic dermatitis may support comprehensive and prompt therapeutic interventions to improve patient outcomes. Addressing skincare, I'm a big fan of skincare, and you know, I really presented some great studies that show the importance of skincare in atopic dermatitis. So cleansers and moisturizers in all patients, including our skin of color patients, is an important component of the management of AD. Of course, there are cultural variations in skincare practices, and we have to be cognizant of that and humble. I like the term that Dr. Alexis used in addressing the cultural practices, skincare practices of our patients, and maybe, you know, helping to be understanding of those. And clinical data that you just saw demonstrates that a skincare regimen incorporating a ceramide-containing moisturizer has been demonstrated to increase stratum corneum lipid content, including ceramides. So thank you so much for listening to our presentation today, and I think we have some time for questions. Yes, thank you for both of your insights here. And we are going to open up the floor for questions right now. So if anyone in our audience has any questions, you are welcome to submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. So go ahead and do that now. And we are going to start, it looks like we've got a couple right now. Um, so the first one we've got is, do you apply moisturizers before or after a steroid cream? So um, I can take that. I always do uh, apply the treatment product first for almost every skin condition. Treatment product is first. So, and the treatment obviously in eczema is a steroid or, or, you know, we have a lot of topical immunomodulators. So I would put that first and moisturizer second. And that's how I instruct patients in my practice. What do you do, Dr. Alexis? Yeah, uh, Heather, I do exactly the same thing. I typically have the patients put the prescription first and then uh, moisturizer after. All right, awesome. Um, here's another one. So how do you treat post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation secondary to eczema? Yeah, I can start with that one. So how do we treat post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that arises from, from eczema? It's a great question and it's really one of the real world challenges that we have every day. Because unlike, let's say we're treating melasma um, or other uh, hyperpigmentation, some, some of the approaches that we'd use for that might not be applicable to an atopic patient. For example, as I alluded to in my presentation, um, I would be less comfortable using a triple combination hydroquinone formula containing a retinoid uh, and corticosteroid together. Um, in an atopic patient with PIH versus a melasma patient, which I would use that uh, as my first line. Um, 
in other scenarios like melasma, we might be using glycolic acid chemical peels and other interventions of that nature. I am not going to use a glycolic acid chemical peel in an atopic patient because of that uh, barrier uh, uh, compromise that we know and, and, and um, the, the very the high likelihood of causing irritation, which we want to avoid at all cost. So what can we do? Well, number one, I really, it's, it's a boring answer, but I really emphasize treat the underlying disease first, because if you don't control the underlying inflammatory disease, the patient will continue to get new flares with new areas of hyperpigmentation, and it's sort of like a, a vicious cycle, and the, the patches just never go away. So number one, control the condition using the variety of agents that we have appropriate for that given patient. And then once we've got to a point of true resolution of an active lesion, where I tell the patient is the, if the area is completely smooth, there's no more scale, there's no more elevation, visually there's no erythema either, uh, it's not symptomatic anymore, um, then we can start to add a, a topical bleaching agent. I'll sometimes use 4% hydroquinone alone or mixed in with a corticosteroid, but I'm not going to use the triple combination. Uh, I might use azelaic acid. And I think uh, Dr. Willery Lloyd has some, I've heard some of your approaches before, and I'd love for you to jump in. Absolutely. I agree. I, I take some time. I do. So I will say um, the only thing I would add is address that with the, so I tell the patients, listen, I know how much these dark patches bother you, especially on the legs, because I'm in Florida, people are always wearing shorts and skirts and, you know, having eczema and hyperpigmentation on the legs does tremendous, tremendously impact the quality of life of our patients. So I don't, it's a very important to say, I understand this is a concern and I totally agree this is a concern, but then we do have to treat your eczema first. It's almost impossible to treat hyperpigmentation on active eczema. And I tell my patients that. Once you're better though, and you're controlled, and I love that Dr. Alexis mentioned, our goal is always clear, almost clear with our patients. We really have to set that bar for our patients and they're under control. Then I'll do azelaic acid mist with trimcinolone one-to-one. I'll just write two separate prescriptions and tell them they can mix it on their hands and apply it to the um, affected areas. And I've had great results with that. All right, well, thank you both for that. Um, so here's another one. We've got, how important is the pH in the cleanser? So the pH is very, very important. I'll talk about that. And the reason why is, you know, we underestimate um, how using alkaline products disrupts the skin barrier. And hopefully in my presentation, I was able to show that, that impact on alkalinity. So alkaline skincare products, cleansers, moisturizers, et cetera. And it's interesting to look at the pH of different products on the market. So for me, it is very important to choose products, ideally that have that pH of between four and six, because they're least likely to cause irritation in all patients, but in particular in our eczema patients. All right, fantastic. So um, here's another one. Is puritis more prevalent in skin of color? Well, I'm happy to start with that uh, uh, that question. Thank you for for sending that in. Um, so, pruritus is it more common in patients with skin of color? And it's a it's a great question in that there actually um, there are some emerging data that suggest that uh, pruritus is more common and might even be more severe in in certain populations with skin of color. Most of this work is coming from Johns Hopkins. Our colleague uh, Sean Quatra out in Hopkins uh, has. Uh, has made some, some interesting findings with uh, um, higher uh, rates of pruritus among uh, the black or African-American population in the, in the large databases that he's looked at. There also seems to be a high, higher rates of pruigonodularis uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, black or African-American patients. And the reasons for these are still not completely understood, uh, but, but these are some of the findings that we're seeing. And it just speaks to the importance of, again, of when we're managing atopic dermatitis, which as Dr. Bullard Lloyd said, where itch is the number one symptom and the source of uh, a great deal of burden. Um, we want to ensure that we leverage the options we have, topical and oral and biologic and phototherapy, as well as skincare, 
we got to keep that. That's a foundation. Uh, Long-term control with good skincare as well, and and by doing that, we can improve itch and uh, and and minimize the sequelae of the itch, which uh, all the complications of scratching and uh, sleep disturbance, etc. Yes, I agree, and I'll just say, you know, I'm not scientifically in my clinical practice. Itch is really a, a big problem in my skin of color patients. And I think that's why we probably even see more lichenification. And um, it's just, a, it is a very prominent clinical finding that I've seen and definitely more parigo nodularis. I've definitely seen that in my clinical practice also. Well, thank you both for your insight there. And we also would like to thank our sponsor one more time, CeraVe, for making this educational event possible. And we also would like to invite um, our viewers to our next Skin Chat webinar, which will be happening at the end of the month of February. So it'll be discussing psoriasis and skin barrier dysfunction and the role of gentle cleansers and moisturizers in treating psoriasis with Dr. Leon Kursik and Dr. Charles Lind. And as always, thank you, Dr. Alexis and Dr. Woolery Lloyd for your wonderful webinar this evening. Um, thank you again, and thank you to all our viewers. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful night.